Hello, and welcome to episode number 357 of the Armin Show podcast, science, people, creativity, learning more about the mind. Subscribe if you haven't. Rate it on Apple iTunes or wherever it might be. Support the show. On this one here, we have a wonderful guest who has written many, many books. Science writer Philip C. Ball joins on this episode of the show. Philip, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm glad to have you on. You have so many books. I always check people's backlog when I am looking at individuals works because i like to see what category they were prolific in and that's the first thing i noticed very clearly a wide variety of books even the titles are pretty uh, substantial how to grow a human and your current book the book we will be discussing today is this one right here the book of minds now before we get into the book what is your general category of interest you are looking to uh, discuss in science writing, or has it been very topics across the way? How do you look at that? I guess it's been very varied. Um, I've I've written books on subjects ranging from a biography of water to the interpretation of quantum mechanics to the history of the development of color and how that's affected the way color is used in art pattern formation in nature. It's really wherever my curiosity takes me. In fact, I, I wrote a book about curiosity as well. Um, and it was a sort of historical look at what that concept was and uh, what it's meant in the past. And I guess what I'm really interested to explore in general is the ways in which scientific ideas and scientific developments intersect with the rest of culture. Um, how they feed into society and how society affects them and affects the way science develops. So it's that interaction, the sort of science and I say the rest of culture, because, of course, science is part of culture, but how those interact. That's cool. Yes, it is part of culture, how they interact. People view science a certain way. I think the general demographic of individuals looks at science as something that is over there until uh, something actually occurs where scientific knowledge is necessary, then suddenly, like epidemiologists became very important for a period, or maybe uh, earthquake experts suddenly become uh, important publicly for a short period. And then it's back to that science is over there for the most part for the general public. Would you say that science should be discussed more is discussed appropriately, like an appropriate amount? How do you view how much the general public takes in science? Well, I, I think it's been very interesting what has happened during the pandemic, because, you know, of course, that's put science at the forefront in, in many ways, for better and worse, because what we've seen played out in the public eye is is really the process of science that is normally hidden away. So, you know, normally what we see is the science after all the arguments have happened and it's not entirely settled, but it's, you know, you tend to sort of see a consensus view, you know, um, coming out of the literature and reported by the popular press. Whereas for during the, the COVID-19 pandemic, that wasn't the case at all. You know, all the arguments were, were out there happening in public, necessarily so, because the this was there was so much new ground, you know, so much wasn't known about this virus. And so scientists themselves were finding their way. But in a sense, that is normally what happens in science whenever anything new comes along. It's just that it's not usually quite so crucial to, you know, the, the, the public and to the public well-being. So I think that that has I hope that one of the positives one of the few positives, really, that's come out of the pandemic is that people might have a better appreciation of how science really happens and that it's not all about settled knowledge, that, you know, there are these debates, there are these uncertainties, and yet we still manage to find some, uh, eventually, some common ground and we still manage to find solutions. You know, the fact that we... The fact that the uh, vaccines were created in less than a year in absolutely record time is a, a testament to what science can do. So even when there are these uncertainties, um, you know, the the power of, of science to provide solutions is still there. So I think that may we may find that that has changed the discussion that we have around science. But certainly, as you say, I would like science to be part of the cultural conversation more generally um, and you know, for it not to be seen as a sort of settled body body of knowledge that maybe you have to learn at school and then you know you leave behind as, as as quickly as possible because it's affecting our lives ever more not just through the pandemic but you know biomedical advances advances in information technology 
you know, even advances in space science, the fact that there's been this fantastic interest in these astonishing images that the James Webb Space Telescope has, has, has broadcast back. You know, I think a lot of people have found that that's really changed their view of where we literally where we sit in the universe, that to see those, you know, vast expanses of every single dot being a galaxy with billions of stars, you know, and we're just one of those really changes your perspective in a way that, that, that you know, that it should do. And so I really hope that science, you know, can sort of open up those sorts of perspectives. I like a lot about the telescope and the imagery because it reminds us very clearly in huge image-based form that some two-minute delay that happens somewhere or some little item that happens with somebody is funny, but I don't know if it should be taken so seriously or most things should be taken so hef hefty. We can still do things with discipline or whatnot. But some of the seriousness looks a little comical from afar. It, gives, from it's afar. A, it certainly gives you a bit of perspective. That's right. That's true. Now, in this book of yours, which I have to describe, I always look at books in detail. I'm very book oriented at this point man, after many years. And I like the, it's like dense. I like the, this reminds me of brain matter. And it is packed with a variety of ideas. It's kind of the way I think about things where I link uh, many different, you went to many different uh, philosophers and neuroscientists and how they view the mind and their representation of what our brain does. What was in your mind when you were to write the book? Why did you decide to talk about the mind in this case? Well, the, the general answer is that I guess what I've tried to do in this book is what I try to do in many of my books, which is to bring together the different perspectives that are often isolated. So there are people, there are neuro neuroscientists, you know, imaging the brain and trying to understand it from that point of view. There's a you know, centuries, if not a millennia old tradition of philosophy of mind, of trying to understand the mind from a philo philosophical point of view. And then there are people who are studying animal behavior and just looking to see what animals do and, you know, what sort of cognition they have. Um, there are people in robotics um, and all of these different communities have been doing their thing. But what I think is starting to happen now is that they're starting to talk to one another um, and they're starting to learn from one another. And so I really wanted to try to give that broad perspective um, of, you know, what it is that we think minds are and what they do and what they can be. The specific answer is that um, several years ago, I was asked to look into writing a piece for a popular science magazine, which was a, it was based on a paper that was looking at um, AI today. And it was really about trying to open up this black box that AI is. You know, we don't quite understand, even the specialists don't quite understand how what AI is doing uh, when it does what it does. And it does it very effectively sometimes. Um, and I, I, I looked into this paper and I talked to a few people and I felt like I wasn't really getting anywhere. I wasn't really getting the broad perspective that I wanted of, of, you know, really trying to think, well, what kind of cognition is going on here? And I sat on it for a while. And um, but eventually I got pointed towards a paper by a computer scientist called Aaron Sloman, who is now an emeritus professor at the University of, of Birmingham in the UK. And he'd written this paper back in the 80s called The Structure of the Space of Possible Minds. And I found that a great image, a great way of organising uh, our thinking about minds. That's certainly what Aaron wanted it to do. So to think of minds as existing in a space, a kind of conceptual space where there are different dimensions that refer to different capacities of mind. So one might be something like you know, how much consciousness they have, how much intelligence they have, how much um, experience they have. You know, what are these dimensions in the, in the space of possible minds? And... Uh, the idea really is that anything that we might think of as possibly having a mind can be located somewhere in that space. So where is AI today? Where are we? Where are octopuses? You know, where are birds? Um, and what I really liked about that, that idea is that it gets away from the usual approach that we seem to end up with, which is that we measure all other minds in comparison to our own. You know, as though we are the exemplar of what minds are and other entities have it to a lesser degree. Um, 
And if we think of our, you know, just as ourselves as being a, a, a dot or a little cloud of dots, actually, within this space of possible minds, and there, have been, there, there are all these other territories where other kinds of minds might exist. So that's really the sort of organising theme to my book, trying to think about minds from that broader perspective. I like the image you have in the book that relates intelligence and agency of many organisms and puts them all in and includes AI and us and different animals and whatnot. Uh, how, what is the message behind that representation connecting uh, intelligence and agency? How can that help us understand minds across all organisms and non-organisms? Well, that, that is um, one of the, the, the simplest attempts to represent the space of possible minds and it's just a two-dimensional space and it so it just has two axes two coordinates as you say agency and uh and it, well and experience actually in that case so there agency refers to the ability of minds to get something done to solve tasks which is something that computers and robots can do experience refers to how much inner life there is if you like how much capacity there is in that mind for experiencing you know hunger pain sadness joy and so on um and as far as we're aware no ai system that has been so far developed has anything of that sort but we clearly do. Do we think that animals do? Um, you know, do, do babies have a different amount of it? It seems that people think they do, actually, that they perhaps experience things more intensely than adults. But, you know, they don't have a lot of agency. They can't actually get a lot done. So, you know, even that very simple representation of, of this space enables us to start thinking about what different sorts of minds are out there. And interestingly, in the study where this was done, it was uh, a study done in uh, 2007, if I remember rightly, by uh, a group of US psychologists. And they, they just asked people about their perceptions of other minds. And they included in, in that, that uh, survey what people think about God, the mind of God, what people think about the minds of dead people, of, you know, ghosts, what they think about the minds, if we can talk of them as such, of companies or countries. So, you know, you can really start to open up the, the, the notion of what actually does have a mind um, and find a space in a, you know, find, find a place in a space like this to put them in and to see how they might compare with ours. I like that. Looking at the companies, I, I think I saw that in one book where they focused on that heavily, where a company is like a large mind. And then in some ways, a city can be like a organization of people as one big collective mind. So I like that look of taking something that we look at as Samsung. And then actually there's a mind space of the employees and leaders in that company. It's an interesting concept, kind of. Yeah, well, it's and, and the, the, cool. the question is, you know, is that um, company mind, if we think about it in those terms, is it just the aggregate of all the, the people that make it up or is it something else? You know, I think there, there, there probably is a meaningful sense in which we can talk about what Google wants to do or, you know, what China wants to do. Um, that isn't you, you're not going to be able to, to point to a particular individual and say, well, it's that person who's deciding that. I mean, sometimes it is, you know, the CEO will, will want to do things in these companies. But, you know, often what the company does won't necessarily reflect even what the CEO in person wants. So, you know, is there a sense in which, you know, there is something more collective, more intangible. And what's interesting, perhaps some might say disturbing, is that when people were asked to sort of think about those qualities that a company has, a company like Google, they place it in the same region in that version of Mindspace as they place God. <laughs> so what's going on there? Um, so, you know, it, it throws up some interesting ideas about how at least how we perceive these other minds. key point here is the perspective we're taking where we think that item is bringing this kind of uh, mindset to the people or it's a strategic message but sometimes underneath it there's something larger at play and it reminds me of one of your quotes of a past guest that I actually had before Alan Jasnoff. I spoke with him and his uh, mom also from Harvard mm. was a professor too and he had mentioned it can be difficult to tell which is the inspiration for which as far as the mind and the computer. How could the computer be the inspiration for the mind or work backwards? Can we speak on that? 
Yeah, well, it's. I'm glad you, you mentioned that because Alan's book, um, in fact, I've got it right on my shelf here, The, the Biological Mind. Um, this was mm-hmm. uh, this was a book that I, I, I this my book sort of crystallized when I went went in 2019. I spent the summer with my family as a visitor at Harvard Medical School. And it was shortly after arriving there when I was sort of wrestling with these ideas and I'd come across Al, uh, Aaron Sloman's paper. And I didn't know what to do. And. I, I, in the local library uh, in Brookline, um, Alan's book was on the shelf and it was being sold off for a dollar a piece. So I thought, right, I'm having that. And I had a look at it. It's called The Biological Mind, How Brain, Body and Environment Collaborate to Make Us Who We Are. And his point is that um, we have to think about the, the, the brain certainly as an organ it's an organ of the body like any other it's a very special organ because it you know does a lot in controlling the body but it's still a part of the body so we really have to think of minds as being embodied and alan's book was a big it, it was really after picking this up that i suddenly thought this is what i've got to do with this idea i've got to write a book about it and not only that but alan is at mit up the road so i can go and talk to him which i which i did and he was he was very very helpful um but um yeah that's that's really one thing that i wanted to stress in in the book that minds all the minds that we know of including our own especially our own perhaps are are they inhabit a body in fact the body is part of the mindedness as far as i'm concerned it's not just all in the brain um so you know the the notion our notions of what we can do um are predicated on what sorts of bodies we have and what sorts of things we know we can do to intervene in the world and what sort of things we know we can't do um so uh, and you know this makes sense because obviously the brain has evolved in a body it's an evolved entity um so we really have to think about minds within the context of certainly organic minds um living creatures um we have to think of them within the context of how that creature has evolved and what it's evolved to do and what sort of environment it's evolved in so it's not as though minds are some sort of abstract thing that you know just appear <laughs> in evolution they have been evolved for particular purposes and that's the way to understand our own mind what it does is what it needs to do or what it has needed to do in the past for our own existence and for our own survival interesting item there also by the way i like that whenever i think of those areas near mit or those areas have a lot of great knowledge based in institutions right next to one another so it's cool to for anyone who's in that area it's like a huge resource sort of like in los angeles sometimes if you're near caltech or jpl suddenly it's like you're near an area of a lot of thought that's a cool feature it absolutely is it you was know, fantastic one thing i like yeah, yeah sorry Go on. Oh, no it's okay uh and uh one thing i like in your book is that you talk this is an important part to me because it tells us about our mind and how it separates us from just going with whatever happens. You had mentioned that while the architecture of our mind is dictated by genes, it exists to free us from our genes to allow us actions that are not pre-programmed. That's such a cool feature because it's like the separating point between us being just an auto automaton or automaton as it's called, or somebody that can, alter the form. Can you speak on that and uh, how that is useful to us? Yeah, well, I I think this is really, for me, this is what a mind is, in evolutionary terms, at least, that, you know, if if you've got, uh, I'm going to speak very uh, anthropomorphically about uh, evolution here, as though there are things it wants to do, which, of course, there aren't. But if, if you've got a complex organism in a complex environment there's loads of things happening it's unpredictable you never quite know what's going to happen then you have two options you can try to hardwire into that creature's behavior a a, a response to every stimulus every circumstance that you think it's likely to experience okay Um, but at some point that's just going to become too complicated there's just going to you know you're not going, going to be able to to do all that hard wiring you just can't predict enough about what the future holds and so it becomes more efficient and more effective to cr- give that creature a mind so instead of just being a as you say an automaton like uh, being that you know just responds uh, sort of automatically to a particular stimulus in a predictable way 
what the mind does is it creates versatility. It creates it gives you a range of behavioural responses. And crucially, it can enable that being to respond to things it has never encountered before. It can improvise, in, you know, in a new situation, which it's going to have to do right in a, in a complex environment. So that, to my mind, is what a mind does. And I think that it's something that happened really very early in, e in evolution. So, you know, it certainly wasn't something that was suddenly granted to humans or even to primates or even to mammals. I think that there is a gradual appearance of that kind of improvisational mind from the very earliest stages, from, you know, taking it right back before the Cambrian explosion. About, it's certainly about 600 million years ago. You see very simple organisms that have nervous systems like sort of little flat worms um, that allow them to, to kind of do stuff, you know, in this way. So it's not very complex and their environments aren't very complex, but it's a, a kind of proto mind. Um, so I think, you know, it's really from the, that very early stage in evolution that things became complex enough. You were in an environment where there might be predators and you had to move around. You had to coordinate your actions. Things were already complex enough that it made sense, if you like, for evolution to give creatures a mind rather than trying to make them little robots. It's wonderful. It's almost inspiring in a way to read that because then it gives us a sense of, OK, that's our thing that differentiates us and gives us ability to switch the course from something versus we have to be an automatic response. Now, in taking into account many different individuals' views of the minds, did you notice any trends or differences from, let's say, philosophers of long ago versus current thinking? Are there any big shifts or do we agree pretty clearly with older philosophers as far as how the mind is? How do you describe the change in view of the mind over time? Well, one of the first things I say about in, in, in the book about the philosophy of mind is that for understandable reasons, until really only very recently, that has meant the philosophy of the human mind. And it's just been taken for granted that when we talk about mind, that's what we're talking about. You know, if we go back to someone like Descartes in the 17th century writing about um, what distinguishes humans from, from animals, and he really does see animals as automata, you know, that, that even if they look like even a dog, you know, if it looks like it's in pain or it looks like it's, you know, happy or playful or whatever, it's just a, an automata and then it's just, you know, that's how we're reading it. But the dog isn't feeling anything. That was, that was you know, how Descartes saw it. And... That was kind. Of, that position was kind of informed by. I mean, uh, you, people still suspect that maybe you know, in the back of his mind, he had this sneaking thought that maybe we're like that too. But he couldn't say that. You weren't allowed to say that at that time. And so he had to say, well, what makes us different is that we have a soul, and that gives us that sort of rationality that animals don't have. Um, and there were actually people, you know, after him in the 18th century, there was a, a, a philosopher called uh, Julian Offre de la Metrie who published a book. That, that said, actually, no, humans really are just machines, too. In fact, it was called Man a Machine. And that really got him into trouble with the church because, you know, there seemed to be no space for the soul anymore. Um, so but, but that's really been the problem with the philosophy of mind, that it's been a, a, about the human mind. Um, but, you know, when we think of it, that, that being said, when we actually look at what philosophers of mind have said, actually, there are some very modern things in it, you know, even going back several hundred years. So, for example, David Hume, the Scottish philosopher in the 18th century, said that although there was, a, you know, a big idea then that humans are uh, guided by reason, you know, that was this was the Enlightenment, right? This was the age of reason. And so that was what was special about us. But even Hume said, actually, we're ultimately we're guided by our passions. Um, and that it was almost as though he was saying, you know, our passions, our emotions are a part of reason. And that's actually, you know, that is a very modern thought. It's only relatively recently that uh, some neuroscientists and cognitive scientists have started taking seriously the idea that emotions aren't just things that get in the way of our reason. They're actually a part of our rationality that, you know, we, we really need them in order to be rational. So the idea of, say, uh, Mr. Spock, you know, in, in Star Trek, of being, you know, totally rational and logical and, you know, free from emotions, actually, it's 
possible that an entity like that wouldn't work very well, wouldn't be very rational, because we need our emotions to inform our decision making. Um, so, you know, I was very struck by that, how David Hume had already suggested something of that sort and uh, something of that uh, sort in the 18th century. I noticed that uh, on the topic of emotions, you had mentioned later on that uh, Joseph Ledoux said that emotions were responses to subconscious processes and they didn't drive behavior. I like that way of thinking perspective because I've thought of that at times that if I don't go through a certain thought process in my mind, I don't have the feeling after. But if I do, then I do have that feeling. So if I cut off this thought process and let's say use my prefrontal cortex and kind of force a alternate thought process or, or don't think about that one, this emotion never comes up. Uh, can you speak on emotions as a follow up to your thoughts and whether they drive behavior or are a response to what you're already logically thinking. Yeah, it's it's a complex issue. And I, I really think, I, you know, I'm agnostic on it and I really don't think this is resolved what exactly what emotions are even, let alone what, you know, what they do. Um, but yeah, you mentioned uh, Joseph Ledoux, the, uh, the, uh, he's a neuroscientist who has suggested that emotions as we understand them are uniquely human because they are they're, they're uh, mediated by language, by, by, by culture that, you know, we, we, we to feel what we really think of as fear, we have to uh, ha we have to almost be able to label it as fear. We have to say, you know, here am I feeling fear. We don't say that literally, generally to ourselves, but that's kind of what's going on there. And, you know, his his position is that for you know animals, they feel something absolutely um, in that situation if they're being pursued by a predator or something. But we can't call it fear. In, in his view, we you know that that actually it's a kind of a some kind of stimulus that is cr causing behavior in the brain. So, you know, it's not to deny that there's a feeling there, but it, it doesn't become fear until language is available to, to label it as such. And the same with all the other emotions. It's a controversial view um, and it, it's but but I think it's it's an interesting one in that it brings up the question of how much language is involved in uh in 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 our own cognitive processes because it does seem that language is our own unique selling point our usp um that you know other animals as far as we can tell don't have language they communicate you know and they have quite complex vocalizations i mean birds you know have these amazing vocalizations these amazing songs but it's not a language in the sense of th that ours is. It doesn't have syntax. It isn't able to communicate complex, abstract thoughts. And even other primates, there are some um, uh, chimpanzees and uh, gorillas, for example, that have been taught, it seems, to make use, make some sort of use of sign language. Um, but there's a real controversy about, you know, what they're actually doing and whether they're actually using it in the way that we would imagine, whether they're actually thinking, you know, something like those thoughts that we think they're communicating. So no other um, uh, creature seems, no other animal seems to have language as we do. And some people would say, you know, that really is what distinguishes the, the, the human mind, L not just that we have language, that, but that because we have language, we have culture and we can transmit, um, I you know, information in, a, in an almost Lamarckian way rather than Darwinian. We don't have to rely on it being sort of handed down through inheritance, being hardwired because we can write it and then, you know, the next generation can read it. Um, and so we can, you know, we, we can... Uh, uh, learn, you know, and, and make use of um, the past resources of our culture that way without having to have them sort of hardwired into our minds, you know, at birth. So, you know, I think language is is something that is quite um, distinctive to humans. And, and the question is what language is for, because there are people who think that it's not simply for more complex communication. You know, as I say, other animals can communicate but that it's actually something about imagination. What we can do with language that I think it's very hard to imagine other animals being able to do is to 
is in a sense project ourselves and our experience into someone else's mind. You know, that's what's happening when we see a film, when we read a book. We're experiencing through language what you know something of what the 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 creator of those things wanted us to experience. That is pretty amazing, and that's sadly I do think that's something that's inaccessible to other animals. It is like a superpower. I have noticed this theme of uh, the importance of language. I like that you describe it that way, that it gives us the ability to, we have our vision and then express it outward, whereas we couldn't imagine, let's say a rabbit passing on their thoughts of the, the field that they're in to another rabbit or something like that. It gives us the ability to, it's almost a very high bandwidth form of uh, like a direct link between two people that the other organisms don't have so it gave us a huge advantage and like you had mentioned i think in the book that suddenly when humans got language then boom off to the races we were mm -hmm. and the link was there i talked with morton christensen and nick chater about their book the language game there's a few uh, language books that i started to run into and i noticed it was a uh, becoming a more popular theme did you start did you notice language as a popular theme very connected with the mind when you were looking into the mind I, I looked into it a bit. I mean, that you know, being aware that actually this this field, this literature is vast, you know, that you could obviously people have written, you know, whole, many books about language and, and the mind. Um, I was this idea of, of language being to inform the imagination is, is something that I took from the uh, linguist Daniel Dorr. Um, who, yeah, they, you know, he's he's made that argument that we, you know, what language is for is about telling stories. And that's something, again, that's something that, you know, other animals don't seem able to, to do. But yeah, I mean, you know, it can, there's, there, there's so much more to be, to be opened up there. And of course, language is a fantastic window into how our minds work. I mean, if we think of, um, uh, well, Doug, I know Douglas Hofstadter has, has talked about this. Uh, what's his name? George Lakoff, I guess, is the one who's talked about, you know, language, uh, about metaphor and how metaphor is, um, is the basis of all thinking. We think in metaphor and our language is saturated with metaphors. When metaphors about time and space, you know, when we understand something, we're standing underneath it. And that, you know, there's a metaphor for somehow how we've assimilated it. So, you know, I, 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 I find that a really interesting uh, consideration because it suggests that there's that, that perhaps what's fundamental in our mind is something about spatial reasoning and time reasoning that language is kind of bootstrapping to be able to do new things. And that that connects to the notion. And this comes from uh, the Harvard psychologist Elizabeth Spelke, the notion that we have core knowledge systems that we are ki that we do seem to be born with that are somehow innate that are the sort of basis of our cognition and they deal with things like uh, a, an intuitive psychology a sort of knowledge that uh, a sort of understanding that there are other agents with other agendas we have an intuitive physics about things that we believe can happen so part of that is about an understanding of space we know that there are things that are closer to us and further away and that they are in certain directions relative to us you know so that seems to be the sort of you know one of the core systems around which we construct our sort of representation of the world this idea of the story and narrative i remind myself every once in a while every two three weeks like do more storytelling because of the impact that it can have and it is a way better transfer of information than if i just send some quotes. Quotes are all right, but they don't have the same impact as if I describe a scenario, the person can relate to maybe some of the emotions of it, uh, maybe a location, uh, what I figured out during the process. And with all those details, you need, it's like a 3D map of that message versus the text of the message. Whenever you just send the text of the message, you always feel like, you're not getting it across. So it's limited in a way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is what, yeah. you know, uh, writers increasingly are told and increasingly talk about, you know, right, the importance of, of, of storytelling. And it's, you know, it is very clear that our minds seem to be wired this way, that we're able to, you know, relate much more clearly to information 
if it's presented to us in a narrative way rather than, you know, just a list. Now, in our in your book, uh, you have a chapter called Aliens on the Doorstep, and we mentioned the uh, telescope and the view of the far-off space. What did you want to bring to the reader about aliens and how our minds will be taking them in, if you will? Well, you know, having looked in the book at the human mind and then all sorts of animal minds, including some fairly, you know, some, some very, very different minds from ours, like minds of octopuses or minds of bees. Now I looked at, at AI and what we can say at the moment about, you know, what sort of cognition is going on there and do they have minds and if so, what, what sort of minds are they? And then, I, you know, I really wanted to, to see, well, how far can we push this space of possible minds? Is there anything we can reasonably say about what extraterrestrial intelligence might be if it's out there? You know, you could sort of take the view that, well, you know, we don't even know that it's out there. If we do, we know nothing about it. We've never seen any signs of it. So how can we know anything? But, you know, there are there are those who say quite reasonably, well, you know, let's think about it. There, it it's not as though anything is possible. And in particular, if uh, life everywhere evolves through Darwinian evolution, and that's not a given. But it seems to be, you know, it seems to be something that is, is, is certainly possible that actually that's, uh, you know, the standard way, if you like, of life becoming more complex, no matter what its biochemical basis. So if Darwinian evolution is responsible, then there are some things that you might expect other minds to develop, you know, purely because they've developed in this situation where, you know, there's reproduction, there's competition, um, there's adaptation to the environment. There are things about that, as I said earlier, that, you know, have structured our mind uh, and that have structured the minds of other creatures in different ways. So uh, there may be something that we can assume about alien minds if they are adapted in a Darwinian sense to whatever environment they have. Um, and if they have, for you know, for example, are they always going to have sexual reproduction? It's not a given in life. There are creatures that don't have it, but, you know, a lot of complex creatures do. And if that's the case, you know, will you have will you have this dimorphism? Will you have two sexes? Could you have 10 sexes? Would you could you have, you know, uh, a sort of um, a continuum of sexes? There's you know all sorts of possibilities. But you can think about what that might do for for minds if that was the case. So that's really what I tried to look at in that chapter of, um, you know, what can we at least speculate about uh, in, in, about other minds, given what we know about the minds on this planet and how they've developed. In looking at the different theories that are related to minds, what are some of the challenges that come up? How can one of them overtake one of the other ones? Because I, I noticed that some of them are somewhat exclusive, like they're separate, so they don't really kind of step on each other. But there's other ones where there's a bit of overlap. How how have we have you noticed the pattern of how certain theories have uh, outdone other ones to become more reputable today? Well, um, if we're thinking, if we're talking about, and I suspect you may be talking about theories of consciousness then yeah it's mm -hmm. um yeah yeah now that's uh you know that <laughs> remains as as contentious as ever i mean you know there are just so many different ideas about consciousness and uh, you know i've got again on my bookshelf here there's so many books that sort of say you know consciousness of the brain the universe of consciousness consciousness explained you know so many theories many of them saying look you know i've cracked the problem and then someone else comes along and says not at all actually i've cracked the problem and the the difficulty in is really in you know telling who if any of these people is right because it's very hard to find any sort of experiments for distinguishing between the different theories that have been put forward people are trying to do that um so for example you know that's really what you want from a theory of consciousness not something that tells you at the end you know so this is how it happens you want a theory that says if this is right 
then we ought to observe this. We ought to observe X when we look at the brain in this way. And some theories try to do that. For example, they might say, well, if, you know, if this theory is right, then the seat of consciousness has to be in the prefrontal cortex. Or no, it has to be in the back of the, um, of the cortex. Or no, it, it's actually in the cerebellum. You know, it's in the, the, the primitive, in the amygdala or something like that. So, you know, if it makes predictions like that, then we can start to uh, to test them. The problem is that they're they're never so clear cut, and you know none of these theories it, it, because we don't even know how to measure consciousness really. So you know there are some. There's one theory that does say it's it arises in the brain stem, in the primitive brain, um, because you know if, if that's out of action, then it's, that's the end of the game. You know you're you're not going to get any consciousness. Whereas you know if 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 that's working, but the the but the the cortex itself self isn't. I mean, there is a, a you know, a, growth, a birth defect that can result in, in children who basically have no, no cortex, but they do show signs of, you know, being able, certainly of being able to respond. They, you know, sadly, they don't live very long, but it, 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 there, are, there are signs that maybe there is some kind of awareness, some kind of, you know, sentience. Um, you know, and, but but then there, there are also these stories. If you think that it's in the the, the 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 rear of the cortex, you know, there are these stories that that say, well, if you you know, if you stimulate the front of the cortex, your conscious experience changes. So you know, it must be there must be something there that's important. And you know, it, it, it's it, it's all interesting stuff, but it never quite you know st pins the the question down to, well, you know, if this proves to be the case if this doesn't prove to be the case this theory is excluded we we seem not to be able to find any experiments that actually exclude theories and that's where we we, we need to get to um but but you know i think the problem is that what we're trying to grasp here what con we don't even agree on what consciousness is is it just a kind of computational outcome of the brain or is it actually the the fundamental thing that we need to start from that we you know our theory has to start from experience and work downwards rather than starting from neurons and working upwards there isn't even agreement about that so it's very hard to to make progress that's true i noticed in the book that you had made a good point of let's say i don't know if the example was a lamp but let's say it was a lamp and it had a plug and you pulled out the plug and then you say, well, obviously the important part of the lamp is the plug, but um, that's just the electricity getting to the main lamp period. So same thing with the brain. Yes, like if you can, uh, disconnect the base of the brain, everything shuts off. So you could say that's where all the things happen, but that may just be the powerhouse or the base or foundation so that the other part can be the main area of consciousness. So it's a perspective thing to take in. Mm -hmm. When you were speaking with uh, or researching uh, many different individuals' content, were there any people that uh, you modeled your that you model your research on, like other uh, similar writers that you look to in a way? Well, there there have been a lot of. Uh books coming out just recently and in the last few years about areas like this i mean you know there's there's always been a constant stream of books about the brain in some sense but one thing i was uh, very pleased to find was that the way i was left thinking about the mind from what i looked into i think is very close to the way the neuroscientist Anil seth uh, talks about it in his fantastic new book being you um, so, yeah, I think Anil and I sort of figure, you know, we mainly we generally see, see things in the same way. And I think that the great thing about Anil's book is that it it isn't trying to push a particular theory. You know, even though he's a researcher in this area, he doesn't have a pet. Th I mean, he has preferences, but he doesn't really have a pet theory that he's trying to tell us, you know, this is the answer to everything. So, you know, that was uh, that, that that's de very, a very big plus for his book. I think I, I found the the writings of of Dan. I mean, Dan Dennett is you know you've got to read Dan, Daniel Dennett if you're going to uh, the philosopher philosopher of mind if you're going to write about uh, in this area. And he writes so wonderfully and so clearly. And sometimes I worry, you know, seductively probably because he's so clear and persuasive that you think he, he must be right. But not everyone thinks Dan is right. Um, but uh, you know, absolutely, he's a, his, his books are fantastic. Kinds of Mind, uh, his 1996 book, which kind of looks a little bit at the sorts of questions I'm looking at, you know, what kinds of mind are there? It's, it was, was a particularly valuable uh, book for, for me to look at. 
Um, I also spoke quite a lot to Christoph Koch, who's a neuroscientist uh, in Seattle, who um, is one of the uh, people who's pushing a, a theory of consciousness called integrated information theory, which, again, you know, I don't uh, hold a, a, a sort of torch. I don't carry a torch for it, but I think it's an interesting idea and, and plenty of others do. And, um, you know, he, he had some very interesting and quite sort of um, unique sort of perspectives on what minds are and what they can do. Um, and then there was a whole bunch of people working in animal cognition. I, you know, one of the real joys of, of, of researching this book was finding out what had been done in, in animal cognition experiments. Um, so, you know, fantastic work on things like tool use in crows and, you know, whether uh, other primates sort of understand, you know, wh wh whether they can use deception, whether they have a kind of what psychologists call a theory of mind. Um, you know, fantastic work on bees. Um, and uh, there, I, I, I mean, you know, I just sort of will recommend it. It came out after my book, but there's a fantastic new book by the science writer Ed Yong, who always writes brilliantly. It's called An Immense World, and it's about the world of animal senses. Um, so I'd really recommend that as well. I did have one discussion on uh, senses with Jackie Higgins. Her book was about the eight different animals and the senses that uh, they have and how ours relate to that. Senses are kind of a cool thing to look at. I also like the theme that you're bringing up that the per sometimes the person who says, this is the exact answer, and then you compare that to the person who says, here's a variety of what we have looked at and potential. This person might seem more sure, but in existence, I've noticed that this person is likely to be more reliable in the long term the pinning it down to one thing i have not seen to be so strongly favored usually so i like that you brought that up that anil seth is more like here's the here's the what we're looking at and at where we are currently as people i like that theme mm -hmm. what would be one takeaway you would want people to bring from your book after they have read, how would you like them to process it or understand it? Well, I, I, perhaps the, the main one is to come away just with a better sense of, uh, it, it's almost a sort of Copernican shift that we no longer sit at the center of things, that the human mind is, is one kind of mind. And it's, you know, it, it, and it is what it is for particular evolutionary purposes. And, you know, that's all well and good. But it's no, by, there's no reason to think it's the exemplar of minds or that, that it, it captures all that minds can do. Um, you know, I'd, I, I, I would be certainly open to the idea that there may be completely different kinds of consciousness to ours. And perhaps ultimately that's what AI will come to have. It won't necessarily have consciousness in the same way that we do. And, but, you know, already some uh, animal behaviorists think that, you know, other animals, that we may need to think about consciousness in new ways for them too. So that decentering of the human um, is, is one of the main things. The other is that I would want to, I, I sort of end up by saying what it seems to me minds are really about is that they find what is meaningful to them in the universe there's and uh, uh, so this notion of meaning it's you know meaning because it's in general because it's useful in some sense um that we are we, we are all filtering everything that is out there to just take in the things that are useful and meaningful to us. So, you know, we don't see in x-rays, we don't see in infrared, they're all, you know, we don't have sharp enough vision to see molecules. There are all, you know, we don't, we can't see dark matter, we can't even, you know, experience it. So that, you know, they're all, there's so much more out there than, uh, that, than, than we directly experience. And we are, we, we've, we've filtered it and selected it because we found out what is most useful for us to survive in the world. So uh, perhaps it's also that perspective that, you know, that remember that what we experience is just a fraction. We don't know how big or small a fraction actually yet of what is out there, but that it is by finding meaning in it 
that we exist at all. And by meaning, you know, I, I sort of say that in terms of, well, it's what's useful to us. But but it's also, I do mean it in the sense that humans also mean it. We assign value to it. We care about those things because it makes sense to do that if they if it's useful to us. And so I think that part of this quest to understand minds better is also a quest to understand what meaning actually is and where it comes from. This is a wonderful message. I would like to say thank you for joining on this episode, Philip C. Ball, and describing to us the various topics from your book, The Book of Minds. I like to gain in perspective the variety of knowledgeable individuals that you brought in in the book and learning more about how we can view the mind as ourselves. Thanks very much, Armin. It's been a pleasure. Glad to. And we are out.